Hey there. I'm aware of the issues we had streaming the 11 o'clock traditional service today. Uh, unfortunately, none of our backup recordings worked as well. So there's a significant issue somewhere that I need to find. So what I'm going to do is upload Dr. Hood's sermon from the gathering here right now so that you can um, hear at least the message. I, I apologize. I understand the frustrations of not being able to come to church and then also your online opportunity um, not working really well. So hopefully this makes it right for this week and hopefully we can avoid similar situations in the future. So thank you for your patience and here's your sermon. Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Glad you're here. Those of you who may be joining us online, we're glad you've joined us, especially if you're out traveling somewhere and for the Labor Day weekend and have uh, chosen to unite with us here at your church while you're away. That's a wonderful thing. In his book, Swim with the Sharks, Harvey McKay tells a story of the 88-year-old president of what was then Japan's largest Enterprise, Matsushita Electric. And this president was answering an interviewer's questions on the future of his company. And the interviewer asked, Mr. President, do you have long range goals? And he said, Of course we do. He said, well, how long are your long range goals? He said, 250 years. <laughs> and and uh, the interviewer said, Oh, well, what's it going to take to succeed in those long range goals? And, the president answered with one word, patience. Going to take patience. We all need patience to achieve not only our long-range goals, but short-range goals as well. In fact, we get into a lot of trouble as a result of our impatience, don't we? Uh, a friend of his found the renowned New England pastor, Phillips Brooks, pacing the floor one day and asked him what his trouble was. And Brooks said, the trouble is, I'm in a hurry, but God isn't. That frequently describes our circumstance as well, doesn't it? it? Sounds a lot like the guy who prayed, Lord, give me patience and give it to me right now. I can't wait. It just doesn't work that way. Patience is a Christian virtue. It's one of the fruit of the Spirit that Paul mentions in Galatians. But it doesn't come naturally, particularly in our day. When we think of instant gratification as practically a constitutional right, the Bible instructs God's people, though, to be patient, even in the face of suffering and persecution. I want you to open your Bibles with me this morning to the letter of James in the New Testament. We're going to look at a passage that not only instructs us to be patient, <clears throat> but it also tells us why we should. James chapter 5, I'm going to read for us verses 7, 8, and 9. And if you're able and willing, I would invite you to stand for the reading of God's word as I read this passage. The Bible says, Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Thank you. Please take a seat. Now, this passage obviously exhorts us to be patient, but uh, with whom or, or with what are we supposed to be patient? Well... I think we first ought to note that we need to be patient with ourselves. Uh, certainly, we require patience ourselves, and we need to be patient with ourselves, not be in a, a hurry. Uh, it's been said that ministry is a marathon, not a sprint. Well, the Christian life is the same thing. It's a marathon. It takes time. Eugene Peterson called it a long obedience in the same direction. A long obedience in the same direction. And the best fruit of committed discipleship only comes to those who are patient. James's illustration in this passage is that of a, a farmer waiting for the land to yield its crop. 
You don't have to be a farmer to know that a crop doesn't spring up overnight, does it? It takes time. It takes care. It takes nurture. But that seems to go against our nature. We like things right now. We want instantaneous results. We want immediate satisfaction. After all, that's the rallying cry of our entitled and consumeristic culture. I want it now. I want it my way. I don't want to wait. Joel Belds once said, the MasterCard mentality is not the way to master life. And he's right. But many of us have yet to learn that lesson. Are you a patient person? Someone rather tongue-in-cheek said that the shortest length of time ever measured is the time between when the stoplight in front of you turns green and the guy behind you in the car back there starts honking. Or maybe you're one of those who is in the car behind. (laughs) It's one way to tell that patience is not your strong suit. We are impatient people. But we have to have patience if we're going to see our crop bear fruit. Patience precedes the produce. And notice, James calls it a valuable crop. That's the way the NIV translates it. New American Standard translates it precious produce. King James calls it precious fruit. In fact, the word that is translated valuable or precious is used in 1 Peter chapter 1 to refer to the precious blood of Christ. And there is nothing more precious than that. So this is the quality of the harvest we will reap from patient discipleship. If we are patient with ourselves as we pursue Christ's likeness in our life, in our experience. And remember also the lessons in Jesus' parable of the sower. That it isn't always the first seeds that sprout that bear the best fruit. On opening day of the 1954 baseball season, the Milwaukee Braves visited the Cincinnati Reds. Two rookies began their major league careers in that game. The Reds won 9-8 as Jim Greengrass hit four doubles in his very first big league game. It was a sensational debut for a brand new player with a name just made for baseball, Jim Greengrass. But I suspect this may be the first time you've ever heard that name. On the other hand, the rookie starting in left field for the Braves went 0 for 5 at the plate. It was a slow start for him, but he didn't give up. Hank Aaron persevered. 20 years later, he broke the home run record set by Babe Ruth. What if he'd grown impatient? What if he'd given up? What if he'd quit? But he didn't. He was patient. He persevered. And that bore valuable fruit in his career. Now, when it comes to discipleship, don't be too patient with yourself. That is, don't become self-satisfied and complacent. There are folks who do that. They're not impatient to see growth in their Christian lives. They're they're content with where they are. They're self-satisfied. Don't mistake that for patience. Those are two very different things. If you're not growing, you're dying, aren't you? Patience is one thing. Complacency is something else. But if you are sincere in your pursuit of Christ's likeness in your discipleship, be patient and let God do His work. He will be faithful to complete the good work that He has begun in you. Be patient with yourself, but also be patient with others. We can learn that in this text as well. Now, the context of this passage involves believers who were struggling to keep the faith in the face of persecution and suffering. And they were maybe growing a little impatient that God didn't seem to be doing anything about it. They were concerned. They were upset. Perhaps they were losing patience with one another as a result. But in the original Greek text, verses 7 and 8, 
They both begin with this imperative verb, be patient. Now, the King James Version sometimes translates that, long-suffering. But it can also be translated slow to anger. In fact, that's what the compound Greek word literally could be rendered as, makrothumia or makrothumos, long or slow anger, slow to anger. We need to be slow to anger in an age where everyone seems to be angered at the least little things. According to a traditional Hebrew story, Abraham, uh, the, the father of the faith, was sitting outside his tent one evening when he saw an old man weary from the journey coming toward him. So Abraham rushed out, rushed toward him, invited him into his tent. He washed his feet. He gave him something to drink, gave him something to eat. And the man sat down and immediately began eating without saying any prayer or any blessing. So Abraham asked him, don't you worship God? The old old traveler said, I revere fire only and no other God. When Abraham heard that, he grew incensed. He grabbed the old man by the scruff of the neck. He threw him out of his tent into the cold night air. And after the man was gone... As the legend goes, God came along and asked Abraham, where's where's your visitor? Abraham said, I forced him out because he didn't worship you. And God's answer was, I've put up with him 80 years, even though he dishonors me. Could you not endure him one night? You see, God is our model for patience as we endure those who dishonor him. God does the same. God puts up with them. His patience extends to them in the hope that they will come to the knowledge of the truth, repent, and be saved. God is our model. He's been graciously patient with us, in fact, and continues to be patient with those who dishonor Him. Now, one of the ways God helps us learn patience is by putting us into circumstances that require patience. So you'll want to think twice before asking God to teach you patience because He'll do it. But the only way He can do it is putting you into situations that require patience. Someone said, uh, to become long-suffering, one has to be long-bothered. And there's truth in that if you stop and think about it. Someone else said friendship between two persons depends on the patience of at least one. If you have two impatient people in a relationship, that relationship usually doesn't endure. But if one is patient with the other, then it can. Generally speaking, the patient one is the one who is more mature emotionally and spiritually. Because that's what accompanies patience as a virtue. So those of you who may be more advanced in your walk with Christ, be patient with those who aren't. Knowing that somewhere along the way, others and God was patient with you. In fact, God continues to be patient with us. Because not one of us is where God desires us ultimately to be in our pursuit of Christ's likeness. We are still pilgrims pressing on in that upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So be patient with yourself. Be patient with others. And be patient for that which James says we are waiting for. And that is the coming of the Lord. We're waiting for the return of our Lord Jesus. In these verses, in verse 7, he says, be patient until the Lord's coming. In verse 8, he says, be patient, stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. In verse 9, he says, the judge is standing at the door. We're waiting for Christ to return for us. That's something James says is near here. And if it was near when James wrote these words... It's certainly near now. It can't be farther away, can it? At least for us, it hasn't come. 
But we are told to be patient. And we're told to be patient precisely because, as James says, the Lord's coming is near. In fact, I've shared this before in other messages. But the Lord Jesus will return for you in your lifetime. So live prepared for that eventuality. It may not be today, it may not be tomorrow or next week. But the Lord Jesus Christ is near and he will come for you. I read somewhere once that patience is what you do while you're waiting. So let me ask you, what are you doing while you wait for Christ to return for you? Are you running with patience the race that is set before you, as it says in Hebrews 12, verse 1? You know, it's easier to wait if you stay busy. It's a, a, a fact that has been studied and verified by those who are experts in that reality. It's easier to wait if you stay busy. In a New York Times news article, journalist Alex Stone tells a story about how executives at a Houston airport solved a cascade of complaints about the baggage claim service. So what they did first was hire more baggage handlers to the, to the extent that they reduced wait times for baggage claim to an industry-leading average of eight minutes. Only took eight minutes for people to get their bags. But the complaints kept coming. That didn't make any sense to the executives until they discovered that on average the passengers took just one minute to walk from their gates to the baggage claim, which meant they were still waiting for seven minutes for their bags to come out of the chute and around the carousel. The walk time wasn't a problem. It was those seven empty minutes staring at the baggage carousel that was the problem. So... The executives moved the arrival gates farther away from the baggage claim so that people had to walk farther and longer to get to the bags, but the bags were there waiting for them when they got there. And guess what? The complaints diminished. People were content as long as they were doing something, as long as they were moving. They didn't mind the wait. They were busy. I know I've said a number of times, I would rather take the long way around on a highway and keep moving than have to sit in stop and go traffic. Wouldn't you? I'd rather keep moving, even if it took me around about an, an even longer time. Well, the same thing is true. If you're waiting, if you're being patient, stay busy while you do. Running the race that is set before you. Serving the Lord. Advancing the cause of Christ in His kingdom through His church. By doing the good things God has designed for us to do. And be careful that you don't get complacent. Just because centuries have passed since James wrote these words, it doesn't mean that Jesus is not coming back. There were some in that first century that were making that case, saying, well, look how long it's been since Jesus. He hasn't come back yet. Maybe he's not coming at all. Delay doesn't mean defeat. In 1907, Lieutenant Colonel George Washington Girdles was given the responsibility for completing the Panama Canal. He had big problems with the climate, the geography, but his biggest challenge was the growing criticism back home. People were saying he would never get that canal finished. Finally, one of his colleagues asked him, aren't you going to answer those critics? He said, in time, in time. He said, well, when then? He said, when the canal is finished. And sure enough, in 1914, it was. And the critics were silenced. The same thing is going to happen with regard to the return of our Lord Jesus. The scoffers will one day be silenced. When Christ returns, we will know that his word is absolutely true and faithful and reliable rock solid the delay is not a result of God's slowness it is a factor of God's patience over in 2nd Peter chapter 3 verse 9 we read that God is patient with you not wanting anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance 
God asks us to be patient only because He is patient. He's patient with those who dishonor Him. Because His patience has a purpose. Namely, our repentance, our salvation. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But God's patience is not infinite. He will not wait forever. James says the judge is at the door in verse 9. So if you have business to do with God, don't be complacent. Don't put it off. Don't delay. Take advantage of God's patience and do that business with Him while you can. Because His patience is not going to last forever. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, your word exhorts us to be patient. As we wait for Christ's return, help us to be patient with ourselves as we endeavor to grow in our Christ-likeness. Help us to be patient with others in the midst of a cancel culture that, that gives no grace to anyone. May we be gracious as you are gracious. And God, help us to continue growing to turn from our sins to turn to you in faith that you might gradually over time complete the good work you have begun in us and remake us in the image of your son our savior jesus christ we pray all of this in his name amen